Welcome to the lectures of the European Society of International Law. I'm Veronika Fikvak, and I'm one of the board members of ESO. Today, we would like to introduce Professor Sergei Sayapin, who will speak about the current trends and future prospects of the Eurasian integration against the background of Russia's war against Ukraine. Sergei Sayapin is a professor of law at Kimep University in Almaty, Kazakhstan. He was trained as a lawyer in Uzbekistan and the UK and completed his doctorate on the crime of aggression at the Humboldt University of Berlin in Germany. Before starting his academic career, he worked for more than a decade at the regional delegation of the ICRC in Central Asia and then returned to academia in 2014. Professor Sayapin specializes in international institutions, international criminal law, as well as law and society. He has published extensively on international human rights law and Central Asian post-Soviet approaches to international law. In 2018, he co-edited a book on the use of force against Ukraine and international law. And last year, he published as the lead co-editor a two-volume research handbook on international conflict and security. Professor Sayapin is the founding editor-in-chief of the Central Asian Yearbook of International Law and International Relations, and the sub-editor for Central Asia of the Brill Encyclopedia of International Law in Asia. He currently serves as a member of the Executive Council of the Asian Society of International Law. Professor Sayapin's lecture today is based on his keynote presentation, which he delivered in April 2023, at the ESOL Research Forum at the University of Tartu. Welcome, Professor Sayapin. You have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Fikvak, for this kind introduction. And many thanks to the European Society of International Law for letting me deliver a keynote presentation on a similar topic at the Research Forum at the University of Tartu and for producing this ESOL lecture. I hope it will be of some interest. Obviously, the topic of my presentation is too big to be covered within only one lecture. Yet, I will do my best to offer some observations, which hopefully will be useful, and to raise some questions, which in their turn might lead to some food for thought. Given the complexity and, in some respects, uncertainty of the topic, my presentation will not be purely on international law. Rather, it will be an exercise in the sociology of international law. I will look at a few challenges in the application of relevant rules and discuss some present trends and possible future developments in the Eurasian integration. So let me start with the very term Eurasia. The concept of Eurasia has been used in various fields, including geography, history, politics, economics, and culture, to describe the complex interactions and interconnections between the peoples and states of Asia and Europe. Thus, in a broad geographical sense, the word is used to refer to the vast region that comprises the continents of Europe and Asia. This area spans over 55 million square kilometers, or about 36.2% of the planet's total land area. This landmass is home to over 5 billion people, equating to approximately 70% of the human population. In a broad anthropological sense, the term Eurasian is often used to highlight the similarities and differences between the two continents and to emphasize their historical and cultural interdependence. However, in recent decades, the term Eurasian has also been used in a narrow sense to describe the integration efforts of several post-Soviet nations, such as the Eurasian Economic Union and some other regional institutions. It is this narrow political meaning of Eurasia that I will focus on. Let us think together how Eurasia in the narrow sense is shaping itself, how it is trying to reshape others and how others are reacting to this. Importantly, it appears to me that this reshaping story is just at the beginning and that we shall be witnessing massive and far-reaching processes in the years to come. So 
what is the Eurasian Economic Union or the EEU? Founded on the 1st of January 2015, the Eurasian Economic Union is a regional trade organization currently uniting five post-Soviet nations, Armenia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Russia. Three more states, Cuba, Moldova, and Uzbekistan, currently have the observer status at the EEU. As promising as this regional integration project was at its early stages, it was later complicated by Russia's attempts, in the words of Chatham House, to reestablish the Russian sphere of influence lost by the dissolution of the Soviet Union, and by external factors such as international sanctions introduced in response to Russia's continued aggression against Ukraine. I will come back to this issue soon. After the dissolution of the Soviet Union in December 1991, economic cooperation between the newly independent post-Soviet states went on in the framework of the Commonwealth of Independent States, or the CIS. Let me quote a few sentences from the CIS statute. The CIS states undertook, by mutual efforts, to ensure the economic and social progress of their peoples, to carry out cooperation in the political, economic, ecological, humanitarian, and other areas, and to cooperate in the formation and development of a common economic space, the pan-European and Eurasian markets, and customs policy." End of quote. As a next step, on the 24th of September 1993, the CIS member states concluded a treaty on the economic union. In accordance with Article 30 of the treaty, Ukraine declared that it would cooperate with the Economic Union as an associate member. Further, on the 29th of March 1994, in a speech delivered at the Moscow State University, the first president of Kazakhstan, Nursultan Nazarbayev, proposed the concept of a more inclusive Eurasian integration. In particular, he called for establishing a single community, for removing all customs barriers, and opening borders. Thus, contrary to common belief, the Eurasian Economic Union was not a Russian project from the very beginning. Russia must have decided at a later stage that it could use the Eurasian Economic Union for its own political goals. How successful is the Eurasian Economic Union? I would say that overall, the success of the EEU has been quite modest. In 2021, before Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, uh, the total nominal GDP of the Eurasian Economic Union was 1.74 trillion USD. That is only 3.2% of world GDP. More specifically, the Union's monetary policy resulted in detrimental effects as early as in 2015. Since the Russian ruble is dominating the Eurasian Economic Union's financial market, international sanctions introduced against Russia and its banking system since 2014, and especially last year, also have powerful secondary effects against the other Eurasian currencies. For example, in August 2015, uh, the Kazakh tenge lost about 23% of its value overnight. And last year, uh, the Kazakh tenge fluctuations were also significant. The other Eurasian currencies have experienced similar effects. Since the beginning of Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine in February 2022, tens of thousands of Russian citizens were reported to arrive in Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan in order to transfer their personal funds to commercial banks in those countries and to obtain internationally acceptable debit or credit cards issued by local banks. As reported by the Astana Times, the amount of personal funds transferred from Russia to Kazakhstan between January and May 2022 reached 72.3 billion tenge, which is equivalent to almost 150 million US dollars, reflecting an increase of 3.1 times over the year. With regard to the common energy market, one may call into question whether some decisions were made in good faith. For example, on the 19th of June 
2022, just two days after the president of Kazakhstan, Kasim Jomar Tokayev, had stated at the St. Petersburg Economic Forum that Kazakhstan would not recognize the so-called Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics, Russia stopped the transit of oil from Kazakhstan via the Novorossiysk port, the official reason being uh, naval mines from the Second World War, which was suddenly discovered in the port waters. After a brief resumption, the transit was blocked again on the 5th of July, after the president of Kazakhstan on the 4th of July, in a discussion with the president of the European Council, Charles Michel, expressed his readiness to help Europe overcome the energy crisis. With respect to transport, in the years preceding 2022, there were some notable developments relative to the construction and renovation of roads, the role of the Caspian Sea in the international transport networks, or the ambitious Belt and Road project. However, last year, as a result of new sanctions introduced in response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, a few threats to the integrity of the Union's transport system became apparent. For example, it was reported that China was seeking alternative rail routes to the West through the territories of Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan, so that the territory of Russia could be bypassed. Also, the sanctions affected more than 500 aircraft, mostly Boeing and Airbus, used by Russian airlines, in that the aircraft are no longer to use the airspace of most countries in Europe and North America. And they may not at this time land abroad, except in a few friendly nations where there is currently no threat of the impending arrest on the ground of termination of lease agreements. The need for Western spare parts is also becoming acute. As far as the maritime transport is concerned, in 2022, more than a dozen luxury yachts reportedly belonging to Russian oligarchs were seized or identified for seizure. In 2022, Russia took wide-ranging measures in breach of its obligations under international intellectual property law in order to attempt circumventing restrictive measures affecting various sectors of Russian economy and to deal with the unfavorable effects of such measures. While, for example, the attempts to put in place what the Russian authorities are calling the import replacement were not technically unlawful. The taking of measures to legalize a parallel import of goods and technologies affected by sanctions most certainly was, and the holders of respective IP rights might contemplate some remedial action. Last but not least, labor migration to Russia from the other, from the other member states of the EEU reportedly tripled compared to 2020. However, last year saw two large and spontaneous waves of migration of the labor force from Russia itself to Central Asia, the Caucasus, Turkey, the United Arab Emirates, and other countries, which remained open to Russian nationals. Whereas the first wave, which took place between February and August, were predominantly economic migrants seeking to save their personal funds, I mentioned this before. The second wave since September 2022 were men of military age fleeing the so-called partial mobilization announced by Vladimir Putin on the 21st of September and their immediate family members. As many as 700,000 Russian citizens were reported to have left Russia since mostly men of economically active age often with higher education and useful qualifications, their migration can reasonably be expected to have adverse effects on Russia's economy already in a midterm perspective. And the overall effect of these factors should also be detrimental to Russia's war effort. So what are the prospects of the Eurasian Economic Union? Probably the biggest problem of the EEU so far is that Russia has repeatedly been trying to use the essentially economic union as a political tool for consolidating its influence in the post-Soviet space. At times, 
statements by some Russian politicians appear to be in plain violation of Article 3 of the EEU Treaty pertaining to universally recognized principles of international law, including the principles of sovereign equality of the member states and their territorial integrity. Such attempts have led the politicians in the member states to insist on the economic nature of the union. And some civil society actors even to call for withdrawal from the EU. Speaking at the Eurasian Economic Forum in Moscow, again recalled the union's economic nature. Given that the start of Russia's use of force against Ukraine in February 2014 was in response to Ukraine's renewed Euro integration course, instead of rapprochement with the prospective Eurasian Economic Union, it is unlikely that any member states will attempt leaving the Union at this stage, at the risk of irritating the Russian leadership. Yet Russia as well ought to cease using the language of threats in communication with its EEU allies if the Union is to be sustainable. In a midterm perspective, the Eurasian Economic Union could experience a higher education crisis. On the 24th of May 2022, the Russian Minister of Science and Higher Education, Falkov, announced that Russia would pull out of the Bologna system. The important implication of this decision would be that workers from all EEU member states, including the Russian Federation, who are holders of the European higher education degrees might not have, this would be a significant blow to the quality of the labor market in the Russian Federation, and, and I believe uh, might cause further brain drain from the country. Given the scale of sanctions introduced against Russia since February 2022, and the departure of major businesses from the Russian market, the prospects of foreign direct investment, FDI, in the country are not promising. It is likely that some dialogue partners will reconsider the level and quality of their cooperation with the Eurasian Economic Union, because doing business with Russia will not be fashionable within a foreseeable perspective. A statement made by the Belarusian leader Lukashenko on the 11th of November 2022 to the effect of possible nationalization of foreign businesses in Belarus will not make the EEU more attractive either. Overall, the Eurasian Economic Union is not likely to live up to its full potential without a full and genuine democratization of its member states' political system uh, without embracing freedom and respect for the rule of law, including international law beyond the legal framework of the Eurasian Economic Union. As the gospel has it, no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Sustainable economic prosperity is impossible where economies are still state-centric, where investors have little faith in their counterparts, where courts are not independent, and where the leading economy in the Union is under a comprehensive regime of international sanctions for waging a war of aggression. In short, the Eurasian Economic Union is in urgent need of internal reform if its progress is to be meaningful. So what are the, what are the other notable Eurasian integration projects? The other Notable Eurasian integration projects include uh, the Collective Security Treaty Organization, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and the Organization of Turkic States. The CSTO grew out of a collective security treaty, which was signed in Tashkent, the capital of Uzbekistan, on the 15th of May 1992. Ten years later, on the 14th of May 2002, the treaty was transformed into an intergovernmental organization. In 2004, the CSTO was granted observer status at the UN General Assembly, and the current members of the CSTO include all members of the Eurasian Economic Union plus Tajikistan. So in other words, the CSTO could be regarded in practical terms as the military wing of the Eurasian Economic Union, 
Or conversely, the Eurasian Economic Union is the economic wing of the CSTO. In my view, the success of the Collective Security Treaty Organization has been quite modest so far. Notably, the organization could not prevent the repeated use of force between its two members, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, and its only engagement in 20 years of existence was in January 2022, during a situation of violence in Kazakhstan. So the full institutional potential of the CSTO still remains to be seen. Although the Secretary General of the CSTO, Imangalitas Magambetov, observed on the 31st of March 2023 that, I quote, an unprecedented growth of the NATO military potential in the Baltic states, Poland, and the Black Sea region was taking place, end of quote. Wisely enough, the CSTO remained of officially uninvolved in Russia's war against Ukraine. On the 15th of June 2001, Kazakhstan, China, Kyrgyzstan, Russia, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan announced the establishment of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the, uh, the SCO. The SCO Charter was adopted in June 2002 and entered into force on the 19th of September 2003. As of this year, the SCO has eight member states, the founding members plus India and Pakistan, both admitted in 2017, uh, making the Shanghai Cooperation Organization the world's largest regional intergovernmental organization in terms of territory and population. Afghanistan, Belarus, Iran, and Mongolia have observer status, whereas Azerbaijan, Armenia, Cambodia, Nepal, Turkey and Sri Lanka are SCO dialogue partners. The SCO regional anti-terrorist structure is located in Tashkent, in the capital of Uzbekistan. The dynamics of recent relations between the SCO members are quite interesting. At the end of April 2023, China's ambassador to France said that post-Soviet nations did not have a status under international law because there was no international agreement reaffirming their status as sovereign countries. On the other hand, uh, on the 19th of May, the first China-Central Asia summit took place, where Chairman Xi delivered a programmatic speech in which he emphasized that the world needs a stable Central Asia and that the sovereignty, security, independence, and territorial integrity of the Central Asian countries must be ensured. Importantly, China undertook to help maintain peace in the region and to help the Central Asian states reinforce their law enforcement and defense potential. This is a powerful message, which I hope was heard and understood in Moscow. One could also remember that a few weeks earlier, on the 26th of April, the United Nations General Assembly adopted a resolution on cooperation between the United Nations and the Council of Europe, which very clearly mentioned Russia's aggression against Ukraine and earlier against Georgia. That resolution was supported by 122 nations, including China, India, and Kazakhstan, all of them being Russia's partners in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. This was the first time since 2014 that these nations voted against Russia in the UN General Assembly on a document concerning Russia's aggression against Ukraine and Georgia. Most definitely, this message was heard and understood in Moscow as well. In turn, the Cooperation Council of the Turkic-speaking states was established in 2009, and in November 2021, it became the Organization of Turkic States. Its four founding members are Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Turkey. In 2019, Uzbekistan joined as a full member. Hungary, Turkmenistan, and Northern Cyprus have the status of observers, although Northern Cyprus is not a recognized state. 
The success of this integration project remains to be seen, but it does appear to be an important development because it already involves and affects at least 156 million people. As far as Central Asia is specifically concerned, the number and intensity of the challenges currently facing these nations seem to require even closer regional integration. For many years, Uzbekistan had a visa regime with most of its Central Asian neighbors. And Turkmenistan's visa policy is still very strict, including with respect to nationals of the Central Asian states. In April 2021 and September 2022, as already mentioned, unresolved border issues led to armed conflicts between Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan. And the fact that both states are members of the Collective Security Treaty Organization could not prevent these conflicts. Water scarcity is another problem, which, if unresolved, will aggravate the situation in the future. The desertification of the Aral Sea and the resulting environmental disaster have been affecting the region for decades. These and other problems could probably be resolved more, e more effectively and efficiently if all Central Asian states were to make more concerted efforts. As early as in 2007, the first president of Kazakhstan, Nur Sultan Nazarbayev, suggested establishing a Central Asian Union, but so far this opportunity for integration has not been seized. In May 2021, the prospects of Central Asian integration were again discussed at an expert roundtable in Almaty, in Kazakhstan. The next major step in the regional integration process was on the 21st of July, 2022, when the presidents of Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan signed a treaty of friendship, good neighborliness and cooperation for the development of Central Asia in the 21st century. If the Central Asian Union ever materializes, it may indeed contribute to its members' sustainable development and to the welfare of all Central Asian societies. So what comes next for post-Soviet Eurasia? In addition to a few significant internal issues discussed a few minutes ago, the Eurasian Economic Union is also lacking the necessary external outlook. Uh, the EU approach to energy focuses predominantly on non-renewable sources, and the concept of green energy does not at all feature in the treaty on the EEU. Developments in 2022, triggered by Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, have shown that traditional consumers of the Eurasian energy resources, such as the European Union, are now working with alternative suppliers, and the perception of the EU dependence on Russian oil and gas was significantly exaggerated. The Eurasian Economic Union should therefore urgently reconsider its energy strategy and contemplate ways to increase the role of green energy. Notably, ecology does not feature prominently in the EEU documentation. The concept is explicitly mentioned only once in the EEU treaty uh, in Article 86, Paragraph 1, in connection with the transport policy. And it is referred to only on two occasions in Annex 20 to the EEU treaty. The environment is mentioned in the EEU treaty no more than four times. And given the impact of the RLC disaster on the economies and livelihood, especially in Central Asia, and the ever-growing climate change concerns, much more attention should now be paid to the environmental policies. Corruption is another major issue in all member states of the Eurasian Economic Union. Unless genuine and sufficient efforts are made to combat it, chances for real progress in the economy and other areas are very low. Among others, the digitalization of state services is a major factor in reducing corruption-related risks. Uh, the member states should invest as a matter of urgency in developing efficient and transparent digital platforms for the provision of state services with the minimum involvement of the human factor. 
the experience of Kazakhstan may be useful in this regard. To conclude on the Eurasian Economic Union, a few more general comments will be in order. Unlike in Europe, where integration was based on a common set of fundamental legal and political values, such as democracy, the proximity of continental legal systems based on Roman law, and the market economy. In the Eurasian Economic Union, respect for these very values is rather weak. Interference of the state in the economy is strong, democratic successes are not obvious, and the quality of the rule of law requires improvement. Since the foundation of the Eurasian Economic Union in 2015, each of its members was involved in armed conflicts with neighbors or experienced situations of violence, which testify to internal instability within the Union. Probably as a result of its protracted conflict with Azerbaijan, Armenia announced at the end of 2022 its intention to ratify the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. This decision might, within a foreseeable future, lead to Armenia's alienation from Russia, which unsigned the Rome Statute in November 2016, and now is a determined opponent of the court. Belarus experienced large-scale protests in 2020 and has been providing political, military, and logistical support to Russia's invasion of Ukraine since February 2022. In early January 2022, Kazakhstan was shattered by internal violence and, as already mentioned, in 2021 and 2022, unresolved border issues led to armed conflicts between Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. This picture appears to suggest overall that economic cooperation is not pacifying the EEU region and the conflict potential is likely to persist. Given the current confrontation between Russia and the global West, it is now quite impossible to contemplate a rapprochement between the European Union and the Eurasian Economic Union. With the reinforcement of authoritarian trends throughout the Eurasian political space, it appears to be drifting away in geopolitical and geoeconomic terms from Europe and getting closer to Asia. As desirable, as a single economic and political space from Lisbon to Vladivostok might once have been, coordination instead of unification among multiple regional organizations and their economic actors is a more likely scenario for the next few years. And with uh, Russia's expulsion from the Council of Europe last year, the role of the OSCE in promoting democracy, respect for human rights, and the rule of law in the Eurasian space could grow. Ladies and gentlemen, with your permission, let me stop here. As I said at the beginning, the topic is vast, and we shall be seeing many more interesting and important developments in this part of the world in the years to come. Thank you very much for your attention.